Hello. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you. Nice. Really just us. Yeah. I'm just looking at myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's harrowing looking at myself. It's... Looking at me is nice, I think. Mm, it's an interesting theory. <laughs> I... It's hot in here today. It's really hot. Yes. Um, but at least it's not snowing. I feel like several streams we've commented on how it was snowing. Oh, you're right. Yeah. We've been doing this for a minute. We have been doing this for a minute. So, we got a couple things uh, to do today before we get into the lesson itself. Hope yes. you're all doing okay. Yes. And it's okay if you're not. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, so, for today... Today's organization, uh, which I think we put in the link. We put in we the put description. Link, yeah. I tweeted about it. We've been we've been hyping this up for a while. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, yeah, this one I'm also really excited about um, because this one is the Black and Pink Pen Pal Program. Did I say that weird? Pen Pal. <laughs> <laughs> Pen Pal Program. Um, so I'm reading from their website. We imagine a world where the prison industrial complex is abolished. <laughs> We'd love to see it. Oh my god, there's more. You simply love to see it. That's incredible. I was already on board. At Black and Pink, we coordinate a nationwide pen pal program in which we match incarcerated members with pen pals who correspond, build relationships, and participate in harm reduction and affirmation. For an incarcerated LBG LGBTQIA2S plus person, corresponding with someone on a regular basis is itself a harm reduction strategy, giving that person a support network outside of prison. So, we've put the link in the description uh, where you can sign up to be matched with an incarcerated person uh, and become pen pals. Mm -hmm. Why do I keep saying it's so weird? You're saying it fine. The weird part is... No, actually... I keep saying pen pals. Pen pals. <laughs> that's not right. Pen pals. Pen pals. Um, but I think that's amazing. I think it's just super relevant to everything about this workshop and yes. to this moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because it is specifically queer people um we all if we didn't already know it have learned a lot about uh we have learned a lot about the prison industrial complex uh -huh. of late mm -hmm. um and also we're all working on writing we are so you can practice your writing help somebody out meet somebody new who probably has a really you know, interesting life story mm -hmm. uh, and needs your help. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm super excited about this one. I think I I'm I think I'm gonna sign up for this too. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm planning to do that today. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I mean, the genesis of this workshop itself was so much to do with building community, mm -hmm. um, even when we can't be physically with one another, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what that would be. So mm -hmm. I really really hope that you will sign up if you have the time, because mm -hmm. uh, this one, you know. There's no money involved. Yeah, for We're a little writing letters. for a little while now, some of you have been asking us, you know, are there any uh, causes that we can support if we don't have money to donate? And like this, this is asking for your time to just exchange letters with this person. Yeah, That's, practice your yeah. writing and like tell them about what you're working on. Exactly. You know. Um. So, so seriously, if if you've been one of those people who's been waiting, here's your chance. Please take it. Yes. We're so excited about it. Yes. Um. And, uh, and let us know how it goes. Yeah, if you end up signing up for it, I would be so excited to hear about your experiences yeah. with it. So let us know. Okay. Um, so we have some submissions to read. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, no. I did not make a note of who they're from. So Sophie. <laughs> I made a mistake. Okay. M made a boo-boo. <laughs> I've, I've erred. Um, okay, so... Can you like vamp for a second while I figure it out? Can I can I vamp? Um, <laughs> Please. It's a uh, well, it's very warm in here. <laughs> uh, Sophie's been saying forever that the ring light that they use to like to, to light our faces is really hot. It is. And I've never really felt it before, but today um, I am I am turning into a baked potato. It's warm. Um, because I am about ninety percent starch, and so uh, put starch. Under, yep, and so put under. Or you're a potato. Heat, yes. Put under heat. I do. I do. I do bake, and that's you know. Okay, thank you. I <laughs> <laughs> that was really good vamping. <laughs> okay, so this first one is from A M. A M. A M. A M. Um, and let me see what they, if they said anything about it. Uh, oh, uh, she said, I decided to use this exercise to revamp a character introduction I did for work in progress, and it was really fun. Um, so this was working on a setting description um, and using concrete language in that setting description to say something about the character. 
This new car wasn't quite tan, definitely wasn't brown, but a sort of sad beige that really set the mood for the rest of the vehicle. The cream suede interior was threadbare, worn away in some spots to become a mottled gray, and broken up only by the aged, multicolored stains it boasted. Everything on the dashboard seemed to only work when you hit it repeatedly, and even then you mostly got stale air from the vents that smelled of rotten watermelon on the hotter summer days, or a radio stuck on the local Christian gospel station. By the laws of the state of Pennsylvania, it shouldn't legally be a car. He was stopped at a red light, grasping the frayed leather of the steering wheel in one hand, the other going for the can of Fanta next to him. As he took a swig, his eyes caught the dusty back window where an intricate spider web lay vacated. Jordan sighed and attempted to set the can back down, but instead knocked it over. Orange soda gathered on top of the already sticky residue that coated the cup holder. He swore, but didn't have time to prop the can upright again before the light turned green. His brakes squealed in protest as he, as he shifted to the gas, and the can rolled off the chair onto the floor, spilling even more of the soda. It would be in poor taste to say this car didn't reflect the state of his life right now. Very nice. We got a lot of characterization in there. I spent the entire time thinking about a sort of sad beige. That got me <laughs> almost immediately. And it sort of, it does, um, it does a lot of different senses. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get smell, which, as we talked about, is a really strong one mm -hmm. um, that is often neglected. Yep. We get the rotten watermelon. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. Uh, we get sound, a radio stuck in the local Christian gospel station. Mm -hmm. um, we get touch, the already sticky residue. Um, the brake squealed in protest, that sound again. Um, and we obviously get a lot of visual description, which, I mean, one typically does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's like very holistically described and it tells us about the character um, and how he can't get it together, <laughs> which who can? Right. I mean, we have his actions too and we kind of see how his actions are creating the space. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Uh, yeah. So well done, AM. AM. <laughs> You're very into applause today. I am very into applause today. These we, we need to applaud our heroes. That's true. Um, okay, so this second submission. Oh, you're so you're, you're gonna read you're gonna read both of them. Wow, you specifically asked me to read both of them today. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you're read both of them look into the camera. Just look into the camera. That's the camera. <laughs> you're really gonna read both of them, right? <laughs> I really am. Okay. What if you can't unzoom out? <laughs> okay. All right. No, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, so the second one is from uh, Kiara slash Ray. Uh, Lele walks me past the worn out couch and the kitchen sink full of unwashed dishes and then stops before his door, says, sorry in advance, it's a bit disorganized. He waits for me to reply, but I can't find the right words to cut through the silence. I let the time run out, breathing in the quiet, and eventually he takes a key out of his back pocket and slots it into the keyhole, turns it twice, and puts it back in its place. Don't want to risk my parents getting in, he mumbles, staring blankly at the wood. They wouldn't do it, I don't think, but it's nice to be safe, you know? I don't. Not really. Never had to hide things. At the most, I had to protect them. Though, maybe it's not that different. Yeah, I say, trying to sound encouraging, and with a sigh, he pushes the door open. The windows are left ajar. It's the first thing I notice. The curtains, red and see-through, rest on the frames, falling unevenly on the wood, and the light gets in only in faint yellow lines. Under the windows, a white desk, full of papers and drawings and uncapped pens. I know I shouldn't keep those open when I'm out, Lele whispers, unprompted. I just, I don't want to keep the air out simply because I don't want my parents in. I can't tell what he's apologizing for, if it's about safety or something else entirely. Regardless, his words get tangled up in the air like butterflies in a net. I know identity when I see it. I know he wouldn't dare to call a place his refuge unless it was sacred. It's all right, I reply, shy as ever. He nods, then moves to the unmade bed to fix the covers and lay them properly on the single mattress. Two clocks are hung above the bed and only one of them works. The word wrong is written in strong, angry letters on the glass of the broken one. I don't ask Lele about it, but he knows I am looking. The wrong is... It's a reminder of this thing that happened once, he says, vague, without even looking up, and I smile. I know. The quiet lingers until he is done with the bed, and he finally turns around. 
His gaze traces his own space as though it were a broken trophy he cannot help but love. The books piled up beside his closet, all facing the wall, too shy to reveal their own names. The X painted in the middle of a small round carpet, pretentious and yet still fitting. A big black poster that says, every day is a struggle, and a sentence written his calligraphy right under it. It really fucking is. Thanks for the reminder. You know about the wrong on that clock? He asks, his eyes coming back to mine, and I take a second to register what he is talking about. I mean, I could tell it was a memory. You could? I think so, yeah. I can tell you would mark memories like that. Hmm, he replies, then sits on the bed and lets himself fall backward. Maybe I am predictable, then. No, you aren't. I just know you. The butterflies clap their wings, and Lele doesn't object. I somehow find it in me to relax my shoulders. Some other really, really good uh, descriptions in there. That la Was that very last sentence? I somehow find it in me to relax my shoulders. I like a lot. I think we get a lot of really good characterization of both the narrator and the other character. Mm -hmm. um, and about their relationship. And I think the setting and the description of the setting is woven in really nicely with that. Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of it is about the narrator's reaction, or in fact non-reaction, to the space. Uh, because it's like, you know a big mess and also pretty weird um and the narrator's reaction is very much just go it's okay and i know and i understand yeah and that gives us a good sense of the relationship mm -hmm. that's excellent that's excellent yeah who's that one by one more time that one is by uh kiara slash ray kiara slash ray thank you thank you thank you um good work i think we're about ready to go into the list today mm -hmm. there's one quick thing that uh that we wanted to say that we wanted to say uh someone in the uh live channel has pointed this out so it seems really important to mention uh if you want to help uh support black and pink by writing letters to people in prison you should you should be prepared that, that can get pretty emotionally intense um yeah so, thank you for pointing that out yeah we really appreciate that um uh it, it it's not going to be easy but it's a way that you can really protect people and help people who need protecting right um we ready for the lesson yes let's do this our lesson today is how can i work on my story without actually writing it Ooh. there we go right it's this is the magic bullet sophie you mean <laughs> i can write it without writing it the next slide is going to tell you that nothing can replace actually writing within the rest of the presentation will be useful <laughs> um so let's get started nothing can replace actually writing it's the hardest part of the job so it's the part you're most likely to find excuses to avoid don't let yourself do it um it, it it gets bad if you let yourself do it for for a little bit um but there's a difference between staying disciplined and bashing your head into a wall a difference that took me a very long time to figure out i was very much on the ladder for a while um and sometimes the best way to solve a writing related problem is to step outside of it for a second you're going to try to flank it you're going to try to get it from another angle fun right? fun so We'll just cover that, and now it's fun allowed. <laughs> um, three techniques we're going to talk about today. Reverse outline, change of format, and off-roading. So we're going to get into those real quick. Reverse outline, as pictured here. Uh, before you drafted, you might have outlined what your story would be. Now outline what your story is. Keep track of which toys come out of the toy box, which threads from your original outline didn't make it, and so on. God, I love a reverse outline. Yeah, reverse outlining is a really funny case of uh, almost every time I've explained it to somebody, they have said to me that it sounds pointless, and then they do it, and they're like, oh my god. No, it's so useful. It's like, um, even if you didn't outline, actually, in fact, especially if you didn't outline uh, ahead of time, a reverse outline can really, really help you because it basically lets you take inventory really, really quickly of what the heck actually happened mm -hmm. in your story. Um, it may also allow you, if you are writing the reverse outline and you're getting bored and you notice that you're skipping certain plot points in order to write it faster, then you really got to ask yourself, like, did you ever need those plot points in the first place? Right. Um, so it is a really, really helpful editing tool, both because then you get to look at it and make sure everything links up and because it can help you cut down later. Yeah. And like, I do think that being able to look at things on the micro and the macro level is super important, um, especially as you're like starting to wrap things up. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're writing something longer, especially, I mean, you can't, you cannot look at the whole thing at once. Yes. And you, you know, if you're, let's say you're writing a novel, I mean, 
it's very likely that you didn't have the time to write a whole novel during this workshop. <laughs> but some people write fast, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, or it could just be a longish short story. And it might be long enough that you can't even read it in one sitting. And right. like that makes it really hard to get the whole thing in your brain at one time. Mm -hmm. And so having an outline to look at to make sure that the progression makes sense right. is incredibly useful. Absolutely. I mean, even if, if you can read it in one sitting, like it's, uh, it, it's just... The thing, the, uh, a consistently really frustrating thing about revision that I bump into over and over and over again is just that um, we aren't very smart. None of us. Our brains don't actually hold very much. I closed the zoom in on <laughs> this, but I swear I'd zoom, in on, I'd zoom in on that right now. Um, none of us are very smart. We can't actually hold that much information in our heads. I have a hard time holding an entire episode in my head. Um, so an outline or a reverse outline lets me skim through really quickly and remind myself of things that I might have forgotten. Whoops. Uh, so give it a shot if you haven't already. And you can do it on like a piece of paper and then you don't have to write your actual story for that day. You did it. You know, I also recommend doing reverse outlines for almost any piece of writing. Any piece of writing. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a really helpful thing. Um, change of format. <laughs> <laughs> this slide, along with being a crime against God, Demonstrate something interesting. The shape of our text does affect how we read it. Experiment with making your text look different while you revise. It'll help you notice things you didn't before. I once had a student who was um, like really, really uh, anxious about rereading her writing. Um, and uh, we had a big research paper and she was having a really hard time with it. And I suggested this to her and she like changed her extremely serious research paper into like bright pink comic sans and the whole time she was reading it she was just laughing so like this can also really help you if you just need a way to look at your own writing differently to take <laughs> it a little less seriously um also reading your writing out loud can help you notice strange phrasings you didn't notice before like how i just noticed that i said notice twice so i took the second one out Cute. I had a fun time with this one. No, that was very cute. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I really recommend reading your writing out loud. You're going to feel so dumb. You're going to feel just so dumb. It's incredible. Uh, especially if you're writing a script and you have actors who are much better at this than you are. <laughs> um, you're gonna, you're just going to feel like the biggest idiot. But I like to read the script out loud. I know. <laughs> but hearing it helps you notice things like... Um, uh, you know, we, we uh, rehearsal is actually a huge part of the writing process for us mm -hmm. because it allows me to hear what it's going to sound like. And the biggest thing I do during rehearsal is untangle complicated sentences and cut long sentences down. Right, and you wouldn't really have known if you hadn't heard the actors. Exactly. exactly. Struggle with it. Even if you're just writing like prose, though, uh, it'll it'll help you notice longer confusing sentences. Prose. Prose. Uh, so that's the change of format. Let's move on before all of our eyes disappear. It's better for um, dyslexic people. I didn't realize that. That's such a useful piece of information. This is loading. I don't know why. What's happening? I don't know. That's unfortunate. Huh. Because this is a slide we do need. Give us a second, everybody. That's weird. Oh, I should probably vamp for you. I'm not good at vamping. <laughs> Oh, but he's doing it. He's no. oh, he's he's almost doing. It. <laughs> real, real supportive. I thought you were there. I'm almost there. You're doing a great job. Everybody needs to stop it. Okay. There we go. Off-roading with your characters. If you're trying to figure a character out, write them into a scene outside your story, maybe even outside of your story's universe. This ATV went so far off-road, it's in space. We're going to try this with one of our creations. I'm so excited about this week's exercise. Yay! Um, and when I say one of our creations, I don't mean our creations. No, no. I mean our creations. Yours. Yours. And ours. Presented in 3D. <laughs> Uh, choose your fighter. We are, are we are bringing him back. Either we are going to talk about Jan, who you might remember from our world building episode, the hamster outlaw, uh, or Verona, our demon killer and killer painter. Remember, so Jan's deal was uh, she has lost her hamster and she's looking for it, but she lives in a society where hamsters are illegal. 
Uh, hamsters are exotic and invasive. They could destroy the ecosystem. There's a cabbage that like brings oxygen to the world. Uh, and so uh, Jan's, Jan's a real lawbreaker. Verona defeats demons by painting. Uh, released rats into the school. The rats were possessed by demons. It was a good time. Um, we're going to take one of them off-roading. So here's what we're going to do. I, by the power of straw poll, have put together Jan or Verona Choose Now. I'm going to put that on the announcements channel of our Discord. People are already putting their votes into the live channel. It's very funny. All right. The, uh, it is now up on the announcements channel in the Discord, so head on over. Let's check out these results in real time. Yay. None yet, because there's a lag problem. There is a lag problem. 0%. Wow, these people don't like either oh, of them. Ooh, Jan ooh, takes an early ooh. lead. Oh, they're neck and neck. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. You can't make us... This is riveting. You can't make us choose between our babies. <laughs> Riveting. Oh, uh, Verona's taking the lead. Uh, Verona, Verona is slowly climbing. People are passionate about Jan in the channel, though. Oh, Verona's staying ahead, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I feel like I'm starting to understand horse racing. <laughs> <laughs> who, who are you Who are you rooting for right now? Uh, I was always uh, rooting for Verona. Same. Yeah. All right. I think we haven't had a vote in a little bit. Okay. Give it a second. I think it is what it is. All right. We have 50 votes. That seems fair. I think Jan's pretty far behind. We're going to go with Verona. So here is the deal. Uh, in a second, I'm going to bring up uh, some uh, a prompt for us to consider with Verona. Uh, one more time. Uh, I'm, I'll, to remind you of the story of Verona, we can go back to our slideshow and look really closely. Um, remember that the way that Verona's story went, I'll read it for you because I know it's really small on your screens, uh, is Verona wanted her exams canceled so she could finally paint. Painting's the only way to keep the demons at bay. Verona released rats into the school uh, to cancel the exams. The demons possessed the rats. The principal was a rat king. <gasps> Verona painted a portrait of the king and somehow defeated him with the painting. We never figured out how, but that's fine. <laughs> And the rats uh, bring in a plague, and Verona skips her exams to paint. Casual plague to, to save the day. So now we have Verona, who paints to destroy demons, and is just totally cool with releasing a bunch of rats. Into oh, yeah, no world. problem. Uh, like Really, kind of the, the, the chaotic hero we need. I have a few scenarios for you, and what I would like you to do is, over in the live channel, um, put in some details from this scenario. I made it too zoomed in. Put in some details from this scenario um, <clears throat> or your version of how this would go. So when you're off-roading, basically what you're doing is you're taking a character and you are writing about them in a scene that is not in your story, right? Um, so, But it's not a waste. But it's not a waste because you're learning about the character in the process. The fact is we talked about Verona for one of these sessions. We don't know very much about Verona. Right. We're gonna, we're gonna learn about Verona today. So in the live channel, you are going to put um, your answer for what Verona would do in this situation, uh, and then we will make a list of what we learned about Verona along the way, okay? <laughs> uh, so the scenario is, your character's at a restaurant eating alone when someone they don't know sits across from them and starts eating a very disgusting sandwich they brought from home. <laughs> this person does not speak. Write showing what Verona does and consider filling in details about what food she ordered, what kind of sandwich she would find disgusting, if the strange person reminds her of anyone, if, they've been, if she's been to this restaurant before, why she's alone, and et cetera. Do you eat alone in restaurants? Yeah. Uh, each time I have received a, um, a job offer, uh, I have celebrated by going to a restaurant by myself. Like for dinner? Uh, usually lunch. Mostly because nobody's calling me at 8 p.m. to tell me that I got a job. Right. Would you eat dinner alone in a restaurant? Like a nice restaurant? Yeah, I've done that before. Yeah. Would I've you? rarely done it. It's nice. Breakfast or lunch, no problem. Uh, I, I think just because like it feels less weird to be on your mm. phone or have a book. Yeah. Dinner oh yeah, weird, I, I but... go to I go to I go to diners by myself all the time. Yeah, sure. The majority of the time I go to a diner. But like a diner. nice restaurant. Basically, what I'm asking is, have I ever would you go to a restaurant where people would kind of expect you to be like on a date or something? I guess not. Well, treat yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do we 
got? Uh, okay. Um, oh, M says the sandwich is made from the heels of a loaf of bread. I think that's a great detail. The heels? Are we doing, does that mean the ends? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Which nobody likes. Verona. Nope. That was Maybe that's controversial. I'm sorry if you like the ends. I like the ends. I'm not sorry to you. <laughs> You're never sorry to me. Never. Um... Verona doesn't like the ends of a loaf of bread, even though there's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. I didn't want to, like, loaf shame. Um, Cecil says Verona would sit there for a minute just staring at them, and then if they don't say anything else, if they don't say anything, she just slaps the sandwich away. Oh. I like that. Amazing. So what do we know about Verona from that? Um, That she uh, isn't bothered by confrontation. And um, she she doesn't really care about being polite. Like most people, I would say, are very, very held back by like social norms. That's, true, that's you know, true. Like I feel like most people would go pretty far mm -hmm. to not have to be like, "Hey, mm -hmm. get out of here." Mm -hmm. But like, she's fine. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, all right, so am I? Should I try to put things that don't contradict? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah so yeah. just add. We're building like... Verona as we go. Okay. So any information that we add here is canon, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> canon, love that. Um, okay. Okay. Well, we said the heels of the bread, but we didn't say anything else about it. So. Um, so it's a, a marshmallow and artichoke sandwich. Said Vari. A lot of marshmallows and artichoke. Everybody just watched me spell marshmallows incorrectly. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Well. I mean, there are a lot of other details about what she does, but I feel like they conflict with slapping the sandwich away. Hmm. I think I saw one about what she does once the person leaves. Uh, I didn't see it. Um, oh, I guess not. I, th I think I misread it. Oh, uh, here's one that doesn't conflict. Uh, this, mm -hmm. The person reminds her of a rude bus driver that never smiles and is really particular about stupid, useless rules. Not fun Piara of Ray. following useless rules. Um, Eau Claire says this is Verona's favorite restaurant. She's never seen this person here before. Verona has a favorite restaurant she frequents. Maybe one more? Um, I like that people are trying to write Jan into the universe. I know. <laughs> I, I respect that. <laughs> I do. The people... It's the most ambitious crossover event. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, should we move on to our next prompt? Uh... Because we do have that she slapped the sandwich away, but but we could take some of these as what she does before that, for example. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, okay, then we could do... Um, Cactus B says, Verona uses condiment packets to paint, summoning her demon BFF to hang out with her, lest anyone else be tempted by the NPC. Packets to paint. Uh, or anything, really. Lady Dominic says, Verona chews so loud to establish dominance. Demon buddies. Can chew like super loud. All right. Okay. So now we know about Verona. Um, we are we're gonna skip the second one I had set up because these answers are a little bit similar to it. We might go back to it if we have time. Um, but let's jump ahead to scenario three. Your character Verona is walking through the woods when they hear a strange sound. Out of the bushes behind them leaps a giant wolf, nearly twice as tall as Verona. Right, showing what Verona does, consider filling in details about why Verona was in the woods, how she feels about the wolf, how strange the situation is for her, what she might be saying or thinking, etc. A wolf. A wolf. 
A big pup. Wow. Wow. Imagine. Big pup. I am imagining. A pup the size of a horse. Oh. I would prefer that to a horse. I mean, but you hate horses. I, I you find, specifically hate horses. I find horses terrifying. No, they're nice. They're scary. They have, like, velvety nice noses. They have velvety nice noses, and they have hammers on their legs. What if I had hammers on my legs? I'm already scared of you. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a very soft nose. <laughs> Um, Unionize the Rat says Verona is a friend to all animals. Wolf can have little a pets as a treat. Uh, David H. Film says that rem that reminds her, did she leave the toaster on? That's funny. That's different. It is different. It took me a minute to figure out how to, how to write it. So, remembers toaster is on Verona's a little scatterbrained. Yeah. Which I think is cool because um, I think like going back to the lesson about characters and how like sometimes it's good to have things that don't seem like they match up, right? right. Like your grandfather. Right. Um, right. Right. Who was like really mean and grouchy, but also love chihuahuas. Love chihuahuas. Um, and from the previous one, she was kind of shaping up to be this like very dominant, um, mm -hmm. like takes no shit mm -hmm. kind of character. Um, but the addition, not of it, it doesn't surprise me that she would be a friend to all animals, mm -hmm. but it does surprise me that she was a little scatterbrained. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, and that makes her very interesting to me. It does. We were going in a very like Wednesday Adams direction and now we have veered away from it which is yeah. really cool but like maybe she still is that but also she's got like i yeah. don't know that's that's cool and that is a different character than just a trope mm -hmm. um let's see oh uh vari says she asks the wolf if she can take a picture of it for later she always wants a new muse ask the wolf for permission to take a picture needs a muse respectful to um, forest creatures. <laughs> Faintly Macabre adds, she's walking home from school, the paved route is winding, and the woods are pretty direct. Okay, well that told us something. I mean, we already knew she was someone, you know, a student. Mm -hmm. um, but it tells us that she'd rather go the most direct route, right. even if that might be more dangerous. Mm -hmm. I think it tells us that she's brave, too. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more? Um, I mean, this takes it in a very different direction. It's very cool, though. Yeah. We have a lot of really cool world-building stuff. I think, and, you and, want more characters, though. Well, yeah. I mean, but it's, it's worth pointing out. So, actually, why don't, why don't we read that one so we can talk about how, how this can be really useful. Okay. Min Max Munchkin says, The wolf's fur is made of folded and torn reams of stained ink paper. That is dope. Min Max Munchkin. That's so cool. Uh, and so, today, we're talking about off-roading as a way of figuring out your character so that if you're feeling really stuck on a character choice, you can learn about them. But what Min Max Munchkin is demonstrating for us here, right, is that... Off-roading is super, super, super useful for generating content. It kind of frees you up. It does. Because, like, the stakes are gone, right? It becomes a game again, yeah. right? You, it's a good way to remember that you like doing this. Um, Ramses uh, started off for me as something that I wrote in off-roading about a completely different idea. Right, that's true. And he was the only good part of it. Didn't even mean to write him, but I needed an uncle character, right. and I wrote him, and I was like, okay, all right, this is cool. Um... Uh, Cactus Bee says she was in the woods collecting natural plant pigments. Uh, which I also think tells us something Relax. about her, because natural a lot of artists are just going to go to the store right. and buy their materials. Ain't good enough. Cool. Um, it's still pretty early. Should we do Scenario 2? Even, sure. though, even though it's a little bit similar? It's, yeah. it's a little bit different, too. Um, so, our last scenario for learning about Verona, and then we'll do our summary. Verona is spending a day at the beach, and they walk away from their possessions for a minute. When they come back, somebody else is using those things as if they belong to them. 
right? Showing what Verona does and consider filling in details about what she might bring to the beach, what she might do at the beach, what she might be saying or thinking, et cetera. So try to focus on the character. Yeah, try to focus on Verona here, not the person who just showed up. Yeah, like other details are great, but what we're trying to do is learn about her. Mm -hmm. And again, for any off-roading exercise you do on your own, go nuts. Like fill, fill, fill the world with those other details. So I, I really like seeing them. Um, yeah, and like, and see if you can build on the things that we've already established right. about her. Mm -hmm. Several people are typing. Um, okay, a couple things about sand. Andy says she kicks sand at them. Goldrug says picks up a fistful of sand and pours it on their hair. Sand throwing. Right. She kicks a pour of sand on them. Um, so they say that Verona's a little bit of a bully? Like, it is her stuff, but, like, this is a very schoolyard bully thing. That's a very extreme sudden reaction, yes. Yeah. Uh, what I like about that, too, is that that uh, also lines up with something else we know about her. Like, um, uh, she, she visited the plague to her school uh -huh. to get out of a test, yeah. and that was the happy ending. Right. Verona's not the best. <laughs> Verona is the best, but Verona might not be good. Um, oh, M says the person was thumbing through her sketchbook and she panicked. Mm. Panics when people look through her sketches. Um, maybe that also tells us that when she panics, she has really extreme reactions. Mm, Verona has extreme reactions when she panics. And like lashes out at people. Right. Lashes out. Um, I mean, people are saying a lot of good things. I'm just not saying all of them because at this point they're contradicting what we've already written down. <laughs> really, really nice try, Alex B. I appreciate that. Oh my gosh. Trying so hard to make Jan a part of it. The person using her things is her girlfriend, Jan. They talk <laughs> about animals, specifically the rats and Jan's hamster. <laughs> Has a girlfriend named Jan. Okay. Has a hamster named Verona. It gets confusing. Oh gosh, it's like maybe it's Verona too. Verona too. Yeah. <laughs> um. She does, however, politely greet the stranger's hamster. No, wait, that's gonna no. Okay, so Jan is her girlfriend. This is not related. Kevin, <laughs> this didn't help. <laughs> We gotta have some fun, huh? All right, well, now that everyone just devolved into Janona, right? <laughs> so I give up. That's cool. Uh, so I'm just gonna, gay, there we go. There we go. <laughs> um, Guys, I feel like we could just assume that she was gay. I, okay. But, some, but, you, but you love to see it. You do love to see it. Lady Dominic, I think you're right. Verona 1 is the hamster, and Verona 2 is Verona. You could be right about that. Um, so what do we know about Verona? Verona doesn't like the ends of a loaf of bread, even though there's nothing wrong with them. Uh, Verona is not bothered by confrontation, doesn't care about politeness, uh, not fond of this food combo, uh, not fond of useless rules or people who never smile, has a favorite restaurant she frequents, can use condiment packets or anything really to paint, can chew super loud, uh, Verona is a little bit of a bully, especially when she panics. She really panics when people look through her sketches. She has a girlfriend named Jan, who has a hamster named Verona. They're gay. Uh, and uh, Verona is a friend to all animals, is a little bit scatterbrained, needs a muse, respectful to forest creatures, um, is very brave and doesn't like to waste time, uh, and uh, knows her way around nature. Store's not good enough for her. Whoa! Anti-capitalist Verona. Anti-capitalist queen. We, yeah. Um, wow, now we know so much about her. We know so much about Verona, and it all links together really well. Yeah, and she's interesting. <laughs> and again, I really like how there's a lot of things that obviously make sense in one character, and a couple things that don't seem to fit in, but mm -hmm. you could still believe that a person could have all those traits. Yeah. And um, 
and it makes it so interesting when people are contradictory. Yeah. So there's no you know there's no magic trick here to uh, to the off roading exercise, right? Um, really, the thing that it allows you to do is again, uh, you can learn a ton about your character so long as you are writing. Uh, but not necessarily about, or not necessarily writing your final draft. It really, really frees you up when you promise yourself, okay, what I'm writing right now can't possibly end up in the story. Um, and also, I think you and I have both had situations. I remember one that you had back when we were in college, actually, where we have started off intending to off-road, and then our off-roading thing became the better story. Yes, I think that did happen to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, again, it's a way of practicing your writing so that you keep getting better, without just banging your head against how frustrated you are with however the, the current project is going. I do think that like a huge part of it is just the psychological, like, oh, well, this doesn't matter. Exactly. So I can just... Exactly. Um, so we, we, we chose our fighter. Uh, we practiced off-roading. Um, let's talk about our your stuck at home so work. Uh, your final drafts are due the evening of June 26th for our last stream on my birthday. Uh, your birthday. Your little birthday. birthday. I'm gonna your big birthday. I'm gonna be thirty. Wow. I'm gonna be thirty. He's gonna be thirty. Wow. Wow. I've been around for a while. <laughs> I also want you to try off-roading on your own. Your uh, the thing you actually submit this week is pretty simple. Just submit a 200-word sample of your revisions to the submit channel on the Discord. We want to keep on calling out what you all are doing. Uh, and most, most, most importantly, uh, we want you to come up with a plan for how you can help the protests for racial justice and against police violence uh, that are going on across the world right now. Um, uh, we, I was definitely thinking a lot about uh, what place does a stream about writing have um, in like uh, in after after a, after a week like this? You know what I mean. Um, and so we tried to give you a cause that you could support with your writing, mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, you know, giving you some tools to express your ideas further is really, really useful for continuing conversations about this. And you need to be able to recharge yourself so that you can then uh, go out and, and fight the big fight, right? And it's a very big fight that really, really needs all of us right now. Um, so don't lose momentum. Yeah. Keep going. Find something you can do every day. There's something you can do. And, you know, if you only have time and no money, that's okay. If you only have money and no time, that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you know, feel that you can get out there yourself and protest, that's great. If you want to support the protest in other ways, that's great, too. Like, there's something you can do. Yeah. So, any questions? Yay! I'm tired, and it, it didn't really land very hard. You could do it again. Any questions? <laughs> that was good. <laughs> All right. Questions time. Put your questions in the live channel. Read that sentence out loud, and so I could tell that it sounded very strange. Oh, there's probably a lag again. Um, so we should vamp until the vamp. questions come in. What, where did the word vamp come from? Like, actually, I'm, I'm curious. Now. That's a good question. Because I keep thinking about vampires. So, I mean, I think of it from, like, the musical context, mm -hmm. right? It's like the little segment of music that mm -hmm. you can repeat over and over again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, until, like, the singer starts singing or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Why is it called vamping? I don't know, but now I would like to know. Um, vamp. Uh, yeah, repeat a short, simple passage of music. I know that, but why? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Scroll up. Okay. It says, that's so... Oh, whoa. What? It comes from It comes from an old French word. Oh, meaning before. No, before and foot. So, like, literally, the original vamping was adding something to a shoe. To, like, huh. the top of the shoe. So... The old French word that this is based on is, like, literally just adding something to the top of a shoe. I think maybe they still call that part of a point shoe that. Oh, really? Yes. That's mm. the only kind of shoe I... Or maybe it's just because a point shoe is the only kind of shoe I've, like, talked about yeah. extensively, the making of yeah. it. But, yeah, like, you talk about the vamp. Okay, so we've learned something. <laughs> uh, what do we have? Oh, 
somebody started listening to the audiobook of the Manual of Detection. Oh my god, I didn't know there was an audiobook. That's I gotta awesome. go get that. Uh, this question. Any advice on titling a story? Yes. Um, I think we could talk about that because yeah. like we were maybe going to do a workshop on it, but then it really isn't long enough. Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, titles, titles are hard. Titles are very hard. They are. And, um, if, I mean, again, I'm assuming pretty much all of you listen to the Penumbra, otherwise yeah. you probably wouldn't be here. But, um, and so some of you might listen to the commentaries as well. And I feel like what we often say in commentaries, especially as the show has gone on, is like when we're recording the commentary, we're like, yeah, we still don't know what the title of this episode is going to be because <laughs> we have like come up with them later and later. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different ways to think about it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the title does come first. Yeah. Day That Wouldn't Die. Day That Wouldn't Die, that's true. You just wanted to do an episode I want, called I Do just wanted, Day That Wouldn't Die. I did. I just like the sound of I think I, yeah, no, I had that title in mind before Prince of Mars even. Yeah. Yeah, that's ridiculous. So me. that's kind of a freebie. Like, you can just write something around it. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, one thing I like to do, one train of thought you could follow is, what is this story actually about? Right. Um, and it's possible that that may dovetail nicely with doing your reverse outline. Mm-hmm. Um, which is also kind of figuring out what did your story turn out to be about. Mm -hmm. If there are any like themes that come up often, mm -hmm. that can be a direction for your title. Um, you also maybe want to think about, this is a weird thing to say, but in whose voice is the title? From right. whose perspective is the title? Very good point. Um, so, for example, um, in our latest Penumbra episode... Controversial title, I know, <laughs> but we ended up calling it uh, Juno Steel and the Mega Ultrabots of Cyber Justice. Right. Because that's very much in Rita's voice. I think the part of that that I found the funniest was when people would tell us that that title was dumb. And, like, the and we were like, yeah. The only response is like, <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, it's right. dumb. That's what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, because it's like it's in the voice of a specific character. Right. Uh, which it isn't always. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted that one to be. Two very concrete things that we have done in the past when we're coming up with the title. First off, if we're just totally stuck, one of us will just start throwing ideas at the other one. Um, like, I think one of the first ideas that I threw at you for the read episode was, like, Juno Steel and the Hearts of Iron, and that was part of how we figured out that we wanted the title to be ridiculous, because every serious tr title we tried out didn't feel right. Right. Um... The other thing is that we often try to make it so that a title technically refers to multiple things in the story at the same time. Um, so Moonlit Hermit is both the plant and its arm. Uh, so, you know, a lot of our titles end up being like that. Yeah. Um, and that is also just a stylistic move. It's certainly not what you need to do. But placing those restrictions on ourselves has definitely helped us to find yeah. titles more consistently. Um, and then I think the other piece of advice I have is... Um, you can think about from whose perspective is it or what character, um, but you can also think about like what what vibe do you want? Like go for the vibe. Mm -hmm. um, so like what genre are you writing and do you want the title to sound like that genre or do you want it to evoke something else? Right. What mood or feeling do you want people to have as they go into your story right kitty cat caper was our return to noir after like a like a long time in insane sci-fi mm -hmm. right um and so the title sounds like a like a pulp novel right yes um mm -hmm. yeah so like there are a lot of di different directions you can go with titling mm -hmm. and there's no one way to do it but um, Goldrogue asks, when Sophie Wig Dad is editing the drafts, what kinds of things do the... Imagine if your dad just always wore wigs. Iconic. <laughs> There's... Just like, think about your personal dad and imagine if he was always wearing wigs. Um, is editing the drafts, what kinds of things do they look for? What are things you've done in the past that you wish you could go back and edit now that you've done better? Um, I look for what can be cut as much as possible. What can be cut? Um... I think it always makes jokes funnier because mm -hmm. um, you write a lot of really funny stuff, but a lot of it is even funnier if you cut out like the whole second half. Yes. Um, no, my 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 humor uh, rhythm 
left to my own devices is definitely just like let it all spill out. Um, and sometimes that works really well. That's part of the reason that you almost never give me a suggestion on a real line. Mm -hmm. um, yes. But that's for true. some characters, you're very good at finding where the actual joke is and isolating it. Um, so cutting as much as possible um, and uh, thinking about weight. Mm. So like, maybe a scene is good but i'm like why are we spending so much time with these characters they're not important mm -hmm. and they're not the main characters of the story and like can we justify spending this much time with them mm -hmm. when we have a limited amount of space um and looking at i guess the character arc within a story um and making sure it's fun Um, Fun's hard to pull off. It's it's worth noting. So that by itself is always a really really valuable goal to shoot for. Yeah. Um, I feel like we've had similar questions, but Unionize Rats Rats asks Dad and Daddy, how do you get inspired to write? I've been lacking motivation lately, and it's bugging me out. Yo, big Sam. <laughs> yep. Since I, since I updated you all last about how my writing's been going really slowly, it has only gotten slower. And same, like, I've never in my life worked so slowly mm -hmm. as I am right now. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard. Yeah. So I have a limited amount of advice to give uh, because I think, like... Because I can't blame you, you know, yeah. like right now, like where, where would you get that energy mm -hmm. from? Where would you dredge it up from? Um, and I think the best thing I have to say about it is like lean on your support systems yeah. because like we're both really running low mm -hmm. on energy and motivation, but we do have each other right? and you know, we like take turns supporting each other. Definitely. Definitely. And pumping each other up. And all like honestly, we basically take turns almost every day. One of us will be like, I'm so tired, and the other one will be like, Take a nap. That's true. Take a nap. <laughs> like we just take turns ordering each other to nap. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, if you can kind of outsource the self care in a way, like taking care of yourself, I think we kind of order ourselves to do it a lot but even that is very hard right so if you can outsource that a little bit it can be a lot easier to take care of somebody else and have them take care of you yep um and then that gives you a little more energy to work with i think yeah so lean on your support systems um try to consume other new media mm -hmm. that um you like maybe you know find a new album that you haven't listened to before or find a new show that you think is cool and it might inspire you in a new direction mm -hmm. um yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the two concrete tips that I would give are, um, first off, uh, this is something that I've been I've been saying to, to Sophie lately. Uh, if you are trying to work on your writing uh, and you find that you're just kind of sitting there intending to work but killing time for hours on end, you're not actually resting and recovering. Just stop. No, yeah, just you need to decide, am I taking a break or am I working? Yeah. Um, because if you are in that weird middle zone, you are exhausting yourself for no purpose. Uh, you will be more tired at the end of that, uh, and nothing will get written. So if nothing's happening, just stop. Uh, take a break. Come back later. Yeah. And like you're <clears throat> you're gonna need more breaks and more time to recharge now yeah. than you normally would. Yeah. And like. You know, I say this so hypocritically, don't beat yourself up about it, mm -hmm. you know, and like, oh, of totally. course, I am beating myself up about it all the time, but at least intellectually, I think we all know we're all in the same yeah. place right now. Absolutely. And it's okay. Yeah. And I, I think the other thing is like, if, you know, uh, if, if, if we're not in a, cir in a circumstance as extreme as we are right now, um, often I find that it really helps me to just show my writing to someone and just ask them, what do you like about this? Right? Uh, the criticism can come later. But if mm -hmm. I show them something and I say, what do you like about this? And they point out something I didn't expect, sometimes that makes me really excited about a part mm -hmm. of the story that I didn't realize I could be excited about. Yeah. And that's like getting a new toy. And yeah. then you want to play with the toy. And then you wrote the story. Yeah, well, that's another like good thing to outsource to. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and like, I don't know, plan with your <laughs> plan with your friends and family to just like give each other compliments a lot. Yep. 
like I'm living on compliments right now. I mean, and obviously I always do, but like right now, mm -hmm. that's kind of like all I have. Mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, if you get your friends to give that back to you, like yeah. it can be motivating as well. Yeah. It's often easier to pick other people up than it is to pick yourself up. Oh yeah, much. So normalize picking each other up so we can all get back <laughs> in swinging. Um, okay. Interesting, specific. Shreya Zuzim says, Dear Potato Dads. Oh, I'm not a potato. No. It's it's Kevin's potato. I am, I'm, I'm a mushroom. They, uh, I can understand where the confusion is because I am several potatoes. <laughs> oh, are you many potato dads? No, the question's actually the question's actually just for me. And it's so, oh, okay. Yes. It's supposed to read, Dear Potatoes Dad. <laughs> okay. Then for you, how do you pace out romantic tension? Because I usually write short stories and I don't know how to drag it out for anything longer. So I assume that you are now writing a novel or something? Mm, or like a series. Yeah. Um, what, in a lot of ways for me, like the way that pacing out romantic tension has worked is actually very similar to pacing out character development. Um, because you want both for your audience to feel like real change is occurring. Uh, like the, the things that happen actually matter. Right. Um, but also, uh, people are messy. And so, you know, real change does not always stick. Um, I will say that some of the moments that have created the most romantic tension on our show are also some of the least popular moments on our show. End of season one <laughs> is, a, is a real big one. Um, but ultimately, you know, when you're creating romantic tension, so much of it is just about where are the two characters at. Uh, and when people grow, they don't grow in a uniform way, and they don't grow consistently, right? Just because somebody has recognized that they have a fault does not mean that they can then always stop themselves from doing that fault. They also don't always just get better. Exactly. <laughs> in a linear way. Exactly. So if they're in a ro if they're in a romantic uh, or if they're in like any kind of tense romantic situation, slowly building that up as the characters grow um, can be really really helpful uh, because then it, it operates on the same principles, right? I feel like I I feel like I repeated myself a little bit. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes, that's okay. okay. Um, Barry asks, Hey dads, would you do me a favor and give me a random character trait? I feel like I've been creating repetitive characters, so I'm looking for a new seed to build from. Okay, I'll give you one, and then you can give one if you okay. want. Okay, alright. Um, how about, you can have one of mine, which is, uh, needs to be exercising and moving around all the time. Alright, okay. Um, you can have one of mine. Which... Is a potato. <laughs> well, well, come now. <laughs> Um, is a potatoes. Is a potatoes. I. You can have one of mine. I keep on almost having a thought, and then you interject, and I completely lose it. Um. Is always sweaty. Oh, that's one of mine too. Oh wow! Right about Sophie. Always sweaty. Sweaty icons. <laughs> um. No, you're not always sweaty as much as I am. Like, you're sweaty, you're very sweaty when it's hot. Yeah. I'm sweaty year-round when it's freezing. It's messed up. Um, uh, how do you balance writing multiple stories at the same time and editing them? Does writing multiple storylines make editing easier in the long run to keep your brain fresh? Yes. 100%. Yeah, there is something to it. Mm -hmm. That's. Uh, I think that we initially started with multiple series for production reasons because we were pumping out episodes pretty quickly we couldn't always get to actors at that rate right um but honestly i wouldn't do it any other way at this point um the thing is after a string of really tough like juno scripts i am sick of every character in that universe so like the way that you feel about your characters where you get sick of them i know that a lot of you really like ours but you need to know that i love them as often as i curse them because they can drive me nuts when i'm having a really hard time um, having Second Citadel to fall back on and vice versa is really useful for helping me keep up momentum. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it can be very aggravating, but yeah. it's definitely useful that mm -hmm. way. Um, M asks, would you consider role-playing with your own characters a form of off-roading? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, oh, you also say... Oh, never mind. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Alex B. asks, Dear Potato Dad and Leak Dad. You might be Am I leaked? Leak? Yeah, you might be leaked. Why am I leak? What do they look like? I forgot. Leaks are like big green. They're like thick green onions. Thick. Thick. 
<laughs> that's funny. Um, uh, if you do an off-roading exercise and it ends up as a better story than the original, how would you decide whether to shelve the original or merge the stories, especially if you've already done a lot in the first? Um, I mean, like, what do you want it to be about, right. I guess? Um, and are they both about, like, presumably they're about the same character or the same sets mm -hmm. of characters. Um, but is it about the same thing or is it two separate stories and you could do, you know, a book and a sequel? Right, right. Um, I, I, th I think this is really case dependent. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, and, but I, I think that the thing that I would say on, in defense of the one that you just off-roaded is if you started your, your story with a great big plan and you're writing it and the plan's not going great and then you off-road and discover something you like way more, what you may have found is that the day that you planned it, you did not come up with the best plan possible. Like like I said earlier, we're all, we're all kind of dumb. We can't fit that much in our heads. Uh, so if you try to do all the planning stuff on one day, that is just one version of you that is planning the entire story. If you are trusting yourself to kind of take it a little bit more loosely and figure out what the story is as you go and adjust it, like by off-roading and realizing actually this version of the character, this version of the situation has way more to it, then you're kind of having multiple versions of yourself across multiple days uh, cooperate in making this story. And any one of those people is an idiot, because we all are. But all together, they can create something that is more impressive than what one person can make, right? Um, HG the lesbian says hi elven dad and hobbit dad oh we've gotten that one before right that's a good yeah. one mm -hmm. yeah you're pretty hobbity 100 <laughs> uh, my question is how do I redo an outline if my story starts changing when I actually sit down to write should I alter my old one or create a new one I think it's a little case dependent but I would probably alter it yeah probably alter it as long as you like it as long as you like where it's going yeah like it's it, it seems likely that it's more authentic to just yeah don't don't do any work you don't gotta do. <laughs> like if if you have an old outline that you can repurpose, repurpose it. If you can write a couple scenes without writing a new outline, write the couple of scenes first. Um, don't feel like just because you have veered slightly off course, you need to like stop yourself and go back to the beginning because then you're just gonna keep on stopping yourself and going back. Um. I saw earlier. Oh, uh, this is pretty specific. J. Barrow, Barrow asks, should a script have spoilers so the voice actors are aware of the whole context? Um, I mean, I guess it depends on what your situation is mm -hmm. because we like work with our actors. We're not like sending a script out into the world and then somebody will do it. Um, we are working with the actors, so we just tell them yeah. um, if there's something they need to know. Yeah, and our situation is a little weird because we do put those production scripts up on Patreon. Right. So I'm always really cognizant that whatever I write on there, you all will get to see before the season's over. Uh, so we tend not to give spoilers in the script, but when we sit down to rehearse, if like a character has like a secret identity or whatever, uh, we will discuss that with the actor pretty extensively. Right. Um, okay. Do we promise to get to this one? Um, Since we've now been asked it a lot of times. Yeah, let's promise. Okay, so I'm going to make sure I wrote that down somewhere. But Okay. Um, sorry, yes, we've been asked the same question multiple times, and I feel like we keep promising. Since the very beginning. I actually think that uh, after our first workshop, uh, Noah might have asked us this question. So Yeah, and yeah. it's... We have to do it. Okay, so yep. <laughs> I'm just writing it down. Um... Oh, we should, we should tell them what it is, otherwise that whole bit was... Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, the question was um, about um, episodic content versus a larger... Right. How do you plan an episode versus a season? Yeah, so we, we do need to address mm -hmm. that. Because it is something that is very fun. It is really fun. So I've written it down, and we will touch on it uh, another time. Um... Oh, what? Oh. <laughs> um, Anna asks, Dear Dan St oh, Danstead and Teacher Dad, do you often allow actors to influence how you write their characters? In my current project, myself and the two main actors have been collaborating on the show in general, and I'm struggling slightly with the image I, ha I have of the characters and the things I know the actors will be bringing. Um, absolutely. Yeah. 
we allow actors to influence. The, uh, there, we definitely allow actors uh, actors to influence the situation. Like, I think it's most direct in voice. This is part of the reason that, I, for me, rehearsal is part of the writing process. Um, I think one of the biggest examples is like in the roughest draft of Janice Beast, Mark talked kind of like Damien talks. Oh, yes, because he was supposed to be like a Cyrano. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we rehearsed and we had and we had Stefano perform the role. And yeah. Stefano is extremely charming. <laughs> but that's not really his thing. It's not his thing. <laughs> so we ended up, I ended up needing to change basically every single one of Mark's lines so that it worked enough. Okay. And I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying something there on that preview. Yeah. And I look very excited, but I have no idea what it is. Now I don't know what we have to go back and re-say. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like we're back up. Yep. Um, but I don't know. Did we? <laughs> okay, we're going to say it again. Okay. We're sorry. Gonna, we're gonna sorry say it again. if you already heard it. What was even the question? I'm in some okay, places. Okay, no, right it's now. about the actors. And... Yes. Um, if you, uh, so if your actors are part of your writing team, then like, then yeah, you know, have them influence everything about where this goes. If your actors are not part of your writing team, I, I would say you still want to have ultimate control over everything, if only because when it comes to putting together a story, you really don't want to make story decisions by popular vote. Um, because so much about, uh, so much about what makes a story work is lots of little compromises that aren't necessarily going to work out for everybody. We have much loved characters. People are freaking out about what I'm doing with my hands. We have much loved characters who right now in our plot lines just aren't relevant. And if I think if we had given those actors a lot of control over where the story would go, mm -hmm. you'd end up with a really, really bloated story where we need to keep following everybody. Yeah, and also like I also think it's really important to be able to stand by mm -hmm. everything that you put out there. Yes. And you don't really want you're like if anyone comes to you and is like but why did you make that decision you don't really ever want it to be uh somebody else wanted to right. do it exactly <laughs> like you have to be able to defend it right if your story says created by or written by you then you are the person who has to answer for everything and, yeah. and you need to be ready for that um i mean it, it sounds like this is a a pretty specific situation where this person is like is collaborating with the actors and i just think I just think you need to lay it out, mm -hmm. like, before you get too deep into it, what is everyone's job, mm -hmm. and what are the boundaries? Right. Like, do you get to make the final decision about these things because you're the writer, mm -hmm. or are they co-writers, in which case, like, all right, then that is what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would be very clear about boundaries and guidelines before you get too far into it. Mm -hmm. um, Should we do maybe one more question? Uh, <laughs> um... Okay, that's nothing. Cool. Um, uh, okay, two kind of similar questions, actually, um, which are basically, what do you do when you have a few ideas or directions that you like equally? Mm. Um, that's what's known as a good problem. That's a very good problem. But still a problem. But still a problem, absolutely. Um, Something that I needed to start doing in order to keep myself moving is I needed to start promising myself that there, that even if you have a few options, no one of them is magic, right? It's not like there is one magical great option that is going to make all of your writing dreams come true and the other however many are going to turn out garbage. The fact is that wherever you go, whichever decision you take, um, you're going to need to do a ton of work in order to make it work within your story anyway. Uh, so if you take that road and you're writing for a while and you're realizing actually this choice I made back here does not work You're gonna need to do a lot of rewriting, but you're gonna need to do a lot of rewriting anyway That's that's a massive part of what this is yeah. is trying things out realizing they didn't work and rewriting them um, so I Guess my answer is kind of pick pick whichever one sounds the most fun and then just, just do see it. if it works. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah I think that's the first thing to say. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, everybody. Then I think that's about it. Mm -hmm. It is warm in here, and I'm going to go lie down. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm just going to add myself if necessary. Is it the first time you've shown this off the stream? No, but it's worth showing. It's worth. Once. It makes a great noise when you open it. I know. It doesn't always. I don't always get it right, mm -hmm. but it does look great. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Again, if you if you have it in you, if you think it's something that you can handle, um, we have a link to uh, Black and Pink in the description. Um, and again, like if these if these streams have meant a lot to you, uh, that is how we are asking you to support us. Yeah. This is like we we want these people to be okay. Uh, and so if you can help us help them to be okay, that would mean absolutely everything to me. And we'll do it with you. Yes. We'll be signing up for it and doing it with you. And again, like if it works out for you to be able to participate in this and you want to let us know about your experiences, we would really love to hear about it. Yeah. I think that's about it. <sighs> yes. Um, yeah. So keep up the good work. Take it easy on the work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you're finding that you're having a hard time writing because you're focusing on what is going on in the world right now, um, remember that a good chunk of your job as a writer is to take in life and to take in people and to figure out how they work. Yeah. And so what is going on is something that you probably need to watch. And also, just ethically, you probably need to watch so you can figure out what to do. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. And be well. Bye, everybody. Bye.